Uh, good morning. Thank you for getting me out of my office, which is not always the most interesting way to spend your time. Uh, I find this very disorienting, actually, with lights in our ears, and I'd like to see faces, and it's not always possible, but I'll try. And at the same time, it's quite a good setting, because I think, not to be melodramatic, we live in difficult times. We live in an age of disorientation. I would say that our life today is moving from one war zone of disorientation to another. I think we've lost our comfort zones. We try to recreate them. I think we've become nomads, pitching our tents, wandering in the desert, trying to have meaningful bearings to find where we are. We think that we found one, and then we find that actually it's not serving us well, and we have to recreate another one. I hope that my, some of my personal observations that I'll pass here will not be wasting your time. I really just want to share. It's as if I'm talking to myself, OK? And I'm, at, I'm of that age now, where you start talking to yourself. So I, I, I should at least feel at home in that. The title, Understanding the post root Society, uh, obviously should mean that just understanding how social media works and the impact of technology on society, if we're going to try to understand our society only through that, it's not enough. We can't simply think that what is happening today is because of social media or because of the effect of technology on every area of our life. That's only part of it. I will be offending your intelligence if I say that we would still have to analyze our society economically, the power structures, culture. Because if we are going to think that simply understanding our society through understanding the social media and the impact of social media, then that would be very, very superficial. So understanding our society needs a deep, analysis of all the different power structures, economic, political, uh, and social. And technology is part of that landscape. One might disagree and agree on to what extent, but it is not the total landscape. And I think we must, we must keep this in mind. I, 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 always, I always try to keep in mind a very, a very simple paradigm in my, in my head with the Hans Christian Andersen story of the nightingale that uh, he did for a time, he was for a time enchanted by the bejeweled mechanical nightingale. On his point of death, he realized that there is still a real nightingale singing beautifully in the garden, and that is what saved him. And we must try to keep this in mind, because if we allow virtual reality, augmented reality, immersive reality, whatever kind of, and it's always interesting that we try to cover up these realities by using the word reality, you know. Uh, there, it's always there. It's always there, and we must keep that in mind. Uh, when Alex told me, what shall we call your piece? And I said, well, fake news. So what else is new? I could also have said, so what else is news? Because uh, coming myself from the world of journalism and from the world of uh, lecturing about communications and about journalism, and it's always interesting to, to spend a period of schizophrenia where you practice and then you reflect about what you practice. It's not easy to combine the two. But I always, I'm always, I'm sure of this, that news has always been, and it's obvious, socially constructed. News is always touched by human hands. At the point of constructing a new story, what to put in, what to leave out, might be for reasons of 
not wanting to offend your owner, not wanting to offend your advertiser, not wanting to offend your readers or your audience. But all these things shape, shape news. So I'm, su I'm sure that uh, we cannot say that fake news exists today or has come about today. Fake news has existed for a, for a very, very, very long, long time. What has probably changed today is that the technology has made it more pervasive. And when we talk, and also when I talk about the social construction of news, it's not only at the end of the supplier, but also at the end of the person who is receiving the news, because I do believe that ultimately the real editor of news is not the editor in the organization, but the receiver of the message. Because not only do we create the world in our image when we are producing the news, but I think also when we are receiving it and interpreting it. Uh, so the purveyors and the producers of fake news are not only those who produce it, but also those who receive it and change it around to suit their own perspective and to suit their own, their own uh, needs. I'm, I'm stressing this not to blame everyone, but not, I don't think that uh, innocence uh, is in order. That on one hand we have deceivers, and on the other hand we have innocent bystanders who just receive what we are all, as Nietzsche would say, all our hands are drenched with the blood of the murder of truth. And not to discuss then what is, what is, uh, what is truth. Um, it's also obvious that in our, in our lives we form in groups and out groups. Those who think like me are in my group and we agree we live in a bubble, even though before I was saying that it has become more difficult to create our bubbles because we have lost our, our comfort zones. We tend to denigrate those who disagree with us and to find flaws in how they think. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So okay. again, this is, nothing, this is nothing new about how we, how we operate as human, as human beings. And the appeals to have education, formal education, creating media programs so that we make our people uh, critical and that they will, they will analyze what, what they receive and what they see. Oh, it's all well and good and we should, and we should do it. Uh, but we should go beyond that as regards the processing of every kind of information. You know, how ready are we as human beings, each and every one of us, to be really open-minded and to be open-hearted and to be ready to change our perceptions in the light of new evidence, of new facts. Um, and again, uh, recently I was reading somewhere it's become impossible to agree on facts. But again, is this something new? I would say no, it's not. It's not new and it's because he, to a certain extent, and perhaps to a large extent, we create facts. Because even facts are a cultural construct. Because what might be a fact in one specific culture is, is not a fact in another culture. Even things that we take for granted in our cultures as as facts are, are also problematic. And we need to problematize even the most simple, simple things in our, in, our, in our life. OK, so as I was saying before, understanding the post-truth society is important. Understanding our society is important. But then what do we do? I'm sure that you will agree with our friend Carl, who says that you know interpreting the world is okay, but the point is to change it. What what do we what do we do about this? And this is where I, I stress that we need to go beyond simply understanding intellectually <laughs> what is going on. Also, I think we need a big dose of humility, <coughs> especially as elites. And uh, do we form part of, some of us definitely, and I myself included, form part of the elite in society. And we have been shocked and feel insulted that uh, 
politicians make fun of us as, you know, as uh, being experts, and we want to tell the rest of society what to do and how to do it. But I think we really need to think carefully of what we have done over the years as intellectual elites, whether we are responsible ultimately for the creation of populism. It's very easy to rubbish what's going on in the States, the presidency, and very easy to rubbish what is happening with Brexit. I would say that those are symptoms rather than causes. And it's mainstream politicians of the center left and center right who are responsible for bringing about uh, populism because we have failed those people. Now we insult them by saying, oh, they haven't gone to university, so they vote to leave the EU and not to remain. I th I'd say, what arrogance. If you talk to those people, because we, then we also say that those are the people who are prone to being the victims of fake news. And again, I think that is, that is very, very simple. We have left behind huge chunks of our society. Their economy has gone into decline. They have lost their jobs. And we want them to thank, it, to thank us for it. And we are surprised and we make fun of them if they then support populist parties and populist politicians who, who offer them illusions, but we haven't offered them our, any solutions ourselves. And we should really be humble about this. I, I, I am a big admirer of Stephen Hawking. And some of the interviews he was giving just before he died was about elites, of which he obviously formed part as, as living in the Cambridge bubble. And he said, we must, we must look at ourselves and see you know, how responsible we are for what is going on and not simply blame, blame others and say, oh, these are you know, uh, creating fake news, uh, they are cheating, they are fooling people, and then that is why they get their support and that is why they disrupt what is going on and they create fake news and they challenge uh, the concept of truth and things like that. But I think we, we should really be thinking about this. And that's why I said going beyond simply understanding what's going on uh, and then also asking ourselves what are we going to do about it. And then my last point will be this. Uh, about five, five, five years ago, five, four years ago, the Open Society Foundation of George uh, Soros carried out a series of very interesting studies in the UK, in France, in Holland, in Germany, where they really focused on the white working class. The white working class, which is the backbone, the backbone of populism, people who were voting Communists a few years ago now vote for Le Pen, vote for Salvini, and vote for the ADF. And uh, in a number of countries, social democracy is in crisis, it's making some comeback in some areas. Christian democracy has been in crisis also. So the mainstream parties have been in a crisis because I, Again, they were absorbed into themselves, closed into themselves, expecting people to come to them and always to accept what they were doing. Even the institutions of the European Union are, I think, uh, you know, part of the problem. In some cases, they are part of the solution, but there's also part of the problem. And uh, especially since the post-financial crisis, um, we have quite a number of top people who have been more sensitive to the needs of banks than to the needs of communities in decline. And uh, we shouldn't lecture. We should, we should have the decency to, to be quiet and not lecture people about, you know, why, why, why are you complaining that your pension is 200 euros a month? 
you should accept what we're telling you because, you know, for the sake of financial probity and uh, so that we balance our budget and that the stability pact will be in place, uh, you should shut up and, you know, uh, accept it. Other politicians, uh, who we've called populists, are challenging, are challenging these things. If we allow only the populists to challenge this, then it's no wonder that people who feel vulnerable and people who, leave, who feel left behind will turn to populists as a source of, if not a hope, but we've tried the rest and we found them wanting, so now we'll try something new. So I really hope that at the cycle, the new cycle of the European budget, we'll be revisiting the Stability Pact because the Stability Pact shouldn't be just the stability for finance ministers, for bankers, and, and for, for financial institutions, and allowing so many millions of people, even in Europe, let alone in the rest of the world, uh, to fall, to fall by, the, by the wayside. So we, we really need to bring people back to believe into the mainstream by, by taking care of what, they, of what they're saying, taking care of what they're feeling, taking care of their real problems, what we call kitchen, kitchen table politics. And the elites shouldn't just care about intellectual things, but also people who have problems paying their bills, people who have problems in the health sector, in the education sector, they need their problems addressed. So yes, let's discuss about uh, post-truth, but let's also discuss post-truth within the reality of the daily life of human beings. Thank you very much. Okay.